Last night, I uh, beard kissed another man. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. And this is our 2015 in review. Yes, it's only the end of January, but we wanted to get the challenges thing out of the way first so we can get started on that. How is your doodle a day going? You know what? It's going pretty good. Um, I have not missed a day yet, and um, kind of what you predicted... Some of the early ones were just getting in the mode, or mood, mode, whatever, but the the quality of what I'm producing is starting to increase as, as I start to like become more comfortable and want to explore different I have been seeing them, and they are great. Yeah, so it's, I, I, I figured the, the good stuff would have come further down the line, but I'm quite impressed with how creative some of them have been so far. Nice. So, and you can always check. We have links down below to our challenges. And what, in six months, we'll do a check in? Yep. So, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, in six months' time. Good, because my planking is not going as well. In fact, I think the last time I checked, my time went down. That's okay. You're, you're just uh, worn out from the previous time you were planking. <laughs> sure. Or something. But this is, not, this is not our challenge podcast. If you want to check out our challenge podcast, you can see it from two weeks ago. This is 2015 in review. Mm. The icebreaker is, what is your favorite stupid, fun, funny thing from 2015? There was a whole lot of serious things yeah. that happened. But what is the, the, the stupid, fun pop culture thing? Uh, for me, it was... Oh, I wish I remember, would have remembered to uh, verify the date, but it was uh, in November. It was a Thursday. I think it was the 12th, November 12th. Um, when it was the day that Marty McFly had gone to the future time. My to, understanding is that day has gone by several times. Yes, if you believe the internet and believe <laughs> memes and, and photoshopping, that time has, has gone past. Uh, but if you consult the movies... Then this past November marked the date in which Marty travels to the future to save his son, thus making all of what occurs in the trilogy of the Back to the Future movies now in our past. There is no more future events that the movie. It just means you need to watch the TV show. Yeah, apparently in the TV series, as you as you told me that um, they do go to the future and yep. whatnot. So I guess we do have a little bit more to look forward to. But I mean, I watched those movies a lot as a kid. Um, I think the second one was my favorite, just because of how crazy zany the future seemed, and that appealed to me as a kid. But um, I've seen them all a bunch of times. I consider it to be one of my favorite and one of the best trilogies of all time. Full disclosure: Having never seen The Godfather, but I hear the third, the third <laughs> Godfather is not particularly good. So, whereas I find all three of the Back to the Future movies to be very, very good, um, enshrined in memory, enshrined in memory, nostalgic glasses notwithstanding. Uh, and so, yeah, that was my favorite stupid, fun pop culture thing: is the the passing of the Back to the Future uh, timeline into my past. Mine is perhaps probably less fun, at least for one person. Um. <laughs> The, the Foo Fighters were on tour this year, and yep. Dave Grohl is one of my musical heroes, uh, along with, you know, I have lots of them, along with, like, Peter Hollins and Alex Boyer and mm-hmm. Lindsey Sterling and Slee Dion and mm-hmm. all kinds of things. But uh, Dave Grohl fell off a stage and broke his leg, and then as the, in, insisted on finishing the show, as medics were... Setting, setting it and splinting it and etc cetera, etc cetera, and applying uh, giving him aid uh, I believe his quote was uh, I can sit down to play guitar and scream I don't need a leg for that I should really watch that the footage of that not the injury part but them splinting it because I know what a what of a like what kind of player he is he's a very full body animated player in terms of guitar, he's very sedate when he when he's on when he's on the chair. I guess yeah, he was in too much pain to move around. But when he's rocking out, like his whole body gets into. It. I can imagine how difficult it must have been to splint if that's what he was doing. Mm, I don't think he was moving very much. <laughs> uh, I think they gave him quite a lot of painkillers. Mm-hmm. Uh, although my 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 other because I have I have two answers for this. My other silly favorite Whoa. pop culture, yeah, reversal. Whoa. Um, my other silly favorite pop culture thing to happen in 2015 is. Also about the Foo Fighters. Are you talking about that uh, giant fan made? Yeah, uh, the band in 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 Italy. They put together a thousand yeah. people, and and played. What was it learning to fly? Learn to fly. Yeah. And it was just the I, I saw the footage from the drone footage and 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 all these drummers and all these these guitarists and, and it just 
It looked really cool. I got chills the first time I watched it. Yeah. When, when even before everybody started singing, when just the the drums pick up and then you get the first couple notes on the guitar, just every like you know probably if you split it down fairly evenly, like you still have what one. Well, I guess so now it'd be two thirds of the people would still be playing guitar, but I mean like just that many guitars mm-hmm. all playing together. Wow, like I, I got I got. Chills, the, the, the amount of the amount of practice yeah. that, that goes into that. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, that was. Oh man, the the notion. And also, given that we live in Canada, the notion of having a field where you could do that that <laughs> remains unspoiled for the length of time it would take to practice and shoot that video, because like they probably did it like ten times, yeah, or more in that afternoon, yeah. And then sort of took the best cut or pieces of the best cuts. Yeah. But... I like to think it's just because Europeans are better stewards of the environment than we are. No, it's because, because living in Canada is bullshit. Well, because I, yeah, I went to Heavy T.O. in 2012, and that... They, they, well, A, they have not had a massive outdoor metal concert there since then. And I don't even think the grass has grown back because it was so wet and muddy by the end of the, the two days. Yeah, it's mostly that weather in Canada is garbage. Yeah. As opposed to Italy, where I understand it is quite nice most of the time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, two oddly Foo Fighters related... I have a connection to one of those as well. I tweeted my x-ray pictures to Dave Grohl in support and sympathy for, for his <laughs> broken ankle. I did that. I'm like, hey man, You're like, I feel your pain. I broke my ankle and I shot him the x-ray of the, the plate and the screws. You were a strange man. I am a strange man, but I, I could feel his pain because mm-hmm. I know what it's like. I've, to... I've never broken a bone. Mm. Um, but yeah, those are, those are our stupid fun things. Mm. And to break down 2015, rather than sort of trying to recap everything that happened in it, there are lots of, of places that do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, even recapping everything that happened in our lives, there are no places that do that. Mm. Um, if you really want a very, very short um, rundown of everything that happened in 2015, you can watch Daystorm's wrap-up, which yeah. will be in the show notes, and it is wonderful. Uh, Daystorm does it every year mm-hmm. for at least, I think, the past two or three years, and it's really fun. Yeah. No, Jim showed it to me as we were preparing and writing this episode, and holy shit, that was, like, it is amazing what he, what he does in the three and a half minutes or so yeah. that it was, so. It's, man, the man has some serious, serious chops. Yeah. But instead, uh, we figured, instead of, yeah, running down a list of current events or world events or how crappy the world felt sometimes in 2015, we would chunk it down a little bit and stick to three topics. Yeah. yeah so three main ones. A thing that you are proud of. Yep. A thing that you're embarrassed about. Yep. And a thing that you learned. It's kind of funny. It's speci- these are specifically about us rather than talking about stuff outside of us. Usually like I'm fairly introspective and you're talking about other people, but I I find it very difficult to be um proud of things that happen outside of me. In the yeah. in the in the the further they are, the removed they are from me, the sort of uh, the less ability I feel to feel to feel proud of them. Yeah. Um, similarly, with embarrassed, I'm I'm not often embarrassed about things that happen externally. I am embarrassed for people. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, and learning, I don't know that I can make a claim that oh, we all learn this thing this year. I think that there are definitely lessons to be learned from events this year. I think we all learned that Dave Grohl's a badass. We knew that. Yeah. We knew that. Like, that, was, that wasn't that was really up for dispute. But no, like, there, there are all kinds of lessons. But to, to say that the world has learned from it, mm. I think, is to display a naive optimism. Yeah. No, that's fair. I, I, can't, I can't say what the world has learned. I can say what I have learned. Yeah. So what are you proud of? So, um... We've talked about it several times, or at least mentioned it several times in the podcast, but last year, I once I healed up from my broken ankle at the tail end of 2014, um, I was a little bit more serious about going to the gym. Um, I made the transition from machines to mostly free weights. Uh, towards the end of the year, I started uh, focusing a little bit more on nutrition, or at least being more mindful of my nutrition. Um 
So, I mean, there's a lot of those kinds of changes and, you know, like dropping weight and whatnot. But I'd say the thing that I'm most proud of uh, was uh, getting into bench pressing. And so, like, there's two levels to that. First, when I first started bench pressing, which was a huge mental hurdle for me because uh, in my mind, I couldn't bench press unless I could bench press with the 45 pound plates on either side. You know, like we call it one plating, right? We don't really count anything smaller than a 45 pound plate as a plate. So, you know, I couldn't do it without benching one plate on either side. And, uh, and that was just like a mental macho thing that if I couldn't do it with the full size plates, then it was like weak or improper or wasting my time or I should just stay to the machines or whatever. So there was a point where I looked over and I said, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And I tried it out. I'm like, I'm just going to do like one rep. And then I did one rep. It's like, okay, I can do two reps, three reps. And I, I think I went up to six and then I stopped as a set. So, I mean, like that was pretty impressive. But the most impressive was um, I did a fitness consultation with a trainer. Just a quick rundown. Mm -hmm. And he and I spent 30 or 40 minutes talking about my health, my goals, my past, my injuries, and stuff like that. Um, You know, he wasn't really taking me on as a client, but this was a free consultation that they offered. And I said, I'm looking to get into a strength based move, like a lot of powerlifting stuff. So I want to. I've never deadlifted before. Uh, I've squatted before, but nothing really impressive. And I do a little bit of deadlifting, or sorry, uh, bench pressing. Uh, and I wouldn't mind learning how to do them properly and increasing them. And he goes, okay, let's go check out your bench. So we go out and load up the 45s and I, and I do a warm up set. And then, uh, and then I do another warm up set where he's actually, he, he's first he washed my form and then we did a set where he corrected it. And so he advised me to, you know, like push the bench away from my back kind of deal rather than thinking about moving the weight. And, um, he told me like position your hands this way and keep your elbows tucked in closer to your body, but you're a bigger guy. So feel free to widen your grip. So, you know, just those little mechanical elements of how to make the, the movement more efficient. Mm-hmm. And then I went and uh, got a drink of water, and I came back, and in addition to the 45-pound plates, he had two 25-pound plates. And so, that, so that is how many pounds altogether? Uh, with the bar, it's 185 pounds. And what's that in metric? Uh, well, I don't know. Some, some number of kilos. Never, I, I don't think about it in terms of kilos. It's around 90. Is it around 90? Okay. We live in Canada, fair, Ryan. Fair. Uh, anyway, so yeah, if the, the bar is 45... And you got the two forty-five pound plates, so it's 100, about one hundred and eighty-five pounds, or it is one hundred and eighty-five pounds. And I looked at him like I've never done that before. I think the most I might have went up is like one forty-five. You know, just adding five pound plates, or maybe one fifty-five adding the two ten pound, like a ten pound plate on either side. But he goes, no, no, don't think about it in terms of trying to do five or six. Let's just do one or two, and I'll be here to spot you. Okay. So, so I get I get under and uh, like I set myself up and uh, so yeah we unrack and uh, the bar goes down comes back up I'm like okay we got one and I do a second one struggling a little bit towards the top and then the third one he had to assist me to get it up past the midpoint because I like, kind of burnt out but basically in the span of ten minutes with a little bit of coaching he not only took my form and kept capacity up to 185 but also he kind of broke down that mental side of it that Hmm. it's actually you know it is doable and this is something that you can achieve and i never thought that i could put 50 pounds in a single session on it now i mean obviously when you reflect on it yeah i could have benched more before i realized i could yeah but that's not that's not what i'm taking away from it i'm taking away from it that that you know, like this, this isn't just, you know, schlubby fat me in the gym, right? Like it's, it, it kind of breaks down that barrier that, you know, this, this is something that you, you can do it. I mean, I might not look like the guys over there, but we're all doing the same thing and I can, I can achieve these kinds but of outcomes. The power lifting was inside you all along. Apparently, apparently I didn't <laughs> need to go searching for it. I found it within myself. Yeah. Uh, now that's not to say that I haven't made mistakes since because I tried 185. Yeah, I tried 185 after that at another time without a spotter. And I got... That seems unwise. Yeah, I got one rep. And on the second rep, I couldn't get the bar back up. And I ended up bringing it back down to my chest, which pinned me to the bench. And then I had to make the decision to call for help or to like roll to the side so the plates would roll off and I would draw all sorts of attention to myself. Or as I tried to do, I tried to just roll the bar 
slowly down my body, not let anybody see, get it over my gut until I finally could get to my hips and sit up. But then the guy in front of me saw it, and he was like, we locked eyes, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> Come help me. <laughs> Res- rescue me. And then, and then of course, Save I, me. I, st- I stood up and tried to, like, pull it uh, Oh, yeah, man, that was really heavy. I just couldn't get under it, man. It was just, like, so heavy, you know? <laughs> As opposed to, thank you for saving my life, because I was going to die can, under the barbell. I can feel my beard growing. I'm going to be here. Because even when, I assume when the gym closes and they turn the lights off for the evening, um... They don't like if you're trapped under your bar. They just leave you there because yeah. like, you wouldn't accept help yeah. normally. Yeah, God, you're such a fitness bro. Just, just leave. You're yeah, I know. Bro. I'm broing out all the time. But, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've I've made mistakes in fitness and nutrition and whatnot in 2015. But I would say the thing that I'm most proud of is breaking down that mental barrier. And it, like bench pressing is the proxy for it, but. That breaking down that barrier that something like this is accessible to somebody like me because a lot of times you look at fitness models or you know strong guys and you think like yeah I mean I suppose I can work a lot and I can approach something to that um, but a lot of times there's that block of like I don't have the genetics I don't have the ability you know I can't I can't do this um, and just something as little as that like learning how to do it properly and having somebody there to, to coach you along um strips all that away and it's like you know what like you focus on you like you're not benching two plates three plates four plates although if you're benching four plates that's really impressive but um like you do you you progress at your own level you try to beat your own numbers and that's the most important thing and uh sometimes it it takes a takes a little bit of you know help from the outside before you realize that so Mm. so i'm yeah i'm really proud of that nice and i've rambled enough so jim what are you proud of for 2015? Well, your you had a bro answer, and I have nerd answer. <laughs> so in 2015, in August, I wrapped up my D and D games. Two of them, in fact. Uh, we have been doing the live stream on the Riot Channel for three years, mm-hmm. and uh, we did it on my channel before that. And then I also had a game that I ran in my apartment for about two years. We started in the 5th edition D&D playtest. And it expanded to become a real D&D game after the playtest was over. Because I just couldn't sort of bear to stop it. And the D&D games operate in the same world. They operate in the, even in the same setting. Uh, you can find a link to it down below. Because uh, our D&D community very recently became public, so you can see the current D&D games that are going on, and their reflections, and the setting, and things like that. But the past D&D games, people had a lot invested in them, and there was a lot sort of going on, and we, we culminated in this 15-player mashup event. They fought a giant evil dragon and a whole bunch of plot threads got tied up and the best part about it, we're talking like a seven hour game by the way running a D fight for 15 people is really challenging <laughs> uh it takes a lot of time even if you're running it really efficiently mm-hmm. as i learned did you, did you count how many rounds it was five that was it five keep in mind we, we averaged about 45 minutes a round keep, keep in mind that a D&D round in game is what 6 seconds 6 seconds yeah so you went 5 so the fight lasted less 30 than seconds a, yeah 30 seconds in the game and you were spending 45 minutes a round yeah because we had 15 people and you, everybody's got to get up walk to the battle map mm-hmm. in addition to that they were fighting about 4 or 5 enemies mm-hmm. um, they were strategizing in between there they were stopping there were snacks um, but do you, yeah, do you feel in retrospect that maybe the challenge rating doesn't reflect reality? Like it was, you'd think that a fight like that might take a little bit longer. And I understand that the longer the fight goes in game, the more likely you are to exhaust the resources of the players, aka killing them. But like thirty seconds for a dragon and some other minions, don't you think there's a disparity there? They were quite strong. Yeah, um, yeah. The level, the the three year game. Uh, Legends of Madian got up to about level nine, level ten. Okay. And the other game was about level seven. Okay. So they they had a they had a good mix. 
Uh, I do. I, I, I also simplified it a bit because I had a couple of people uh, who were guests who were visiting, and so one of them got to play the dragon. So instead of like a full fledged, straight up dragon, what they got was an evil undead dragon that fits on like a file card, <laughs> um, which is really fun because then I didn't have to worry about me being the one who killed somebody's character that they put three years into. Yeah. And uh, that was nice, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I only killed one one PC, and I'm like, I could have done better. I'm just saying, as a killer GM, I could have done better. But the best part about it wasn't even the fight. The fight was the sort of irrelevant part. It was the conversations that we got to have around it, is that this notion that, that your character is going out to p- possibly to die. And they had considered that they're like, you know, they're, they're, there's a, there's there's a war going on around them, and they're like, what what if we die? And then the people they they look to for leadership were like, we don't care if you die. Every minute you buy, every like every second you buy saves lives. Mm-hmm. Um, we are we, like we are willing to spend your lives in this cause. Are you willing to give them? Mm-hmm. So is essentially their their last night on on Earth. What do they do with it? And we got some really interesting storytelling out of that, out of, out, of, out of 14 characters. It was the same afterward when I got everyone to tell me their denouement. How does your character's story end? How do they fit into this world afterward? And everybody sort of got to... It isn't very often that you get to finish your character's story. I've been playing D and D off and on for the last ten years, and it's happened once for me where we didn't quit or the game didn't fall apart. Where we actually had a moment where we said, "Okay, this can be the end of the story for the mm-hmm. character." So yeah, it doesn't and, happen and, and you're very like, often yeah. at all. And I, I tacked a couple sentences onto onto each one of them, and now those are those are true. They're canon. They're in. They exist in the D and D setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, the current games take place ten years after that event, so they don't have to live in its shadow. Mm-hmm. But the, those, their actions ring forward. I have been running games in that setting for 10 years, and actions from 10 years ago are still ringing forward into today in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. It's sort of fun when I'll, I'll have that moment where I, I sneak in a callback to something, and I'm the only one that gets it. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because I get it. <laughs> Now it's the the statement I've been making since the beginning is you will permit me my little jokes, <clears throat> but it was it was really great to see all of that come to fruition. And afterwards, we went out to the pub, and I got to sort of fill them in on some of the stuff that I'd had working behind the scenes, some of the stuff that almost happened but we didn't quite get there, or. Uh, we dug into some of the subplot things that that fell by the wayside. I, you know, I answered a lot of questions, and I got to find out how much that campaign, like, because the online game we have retired, mm-hmm. at least for the time being. Uh, and I got to find out how much that ca- campaign meant to everybody. And it was a really good feeling, and I'm really proud of sort of the fact that we managed to culminate three years in into seven hours of. Rolling dice. <laughs> God, I'm such a nerd. Yeah, that's okay. I forgive you. Well, good. Forgiveness of a bro means that I will get my wings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, things that we're embarrassed about. Uh, you mean other than flexing on camera for the podcast? Um, for those who are listening. For those who are listening, Huck was flexing. It was quite impressive. It was, I was displaying my, my bro-ness. Um... I'm embarrassed about being a shut-in. Yeah? Yeah, I spent a lot of 2015 sort of taking a step back from stuff. And probably like probably more than I should have. And we did a video about it. Uh, I am here now. And uh, we'll put that in the show notes. But that was, that was when I went to an art opening. And there was all kinds of really weird and great stuff there. But it is easy to get caught up in that grind. Mm-hmm. Um, the work that I'm doing now occupy it, 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 it doesn't just occupy my time it occupies a lot of my attention so it is easier to get caught in that thing of go home and sleep mm-hmm. and opt out of doing things even though doing things is really fun 
and doing things gives me energy. Mm-hmm. And so it is a thing I regret. I definitely skipped out on a lot of stuff that I otherwise shouldn't have. And or and I relied on other people like Kaylee and you and uh, Ryan Consul. Um, you can find his channel in the in the, in the show notes too. Uh, to uh, give me that impetus to go outside mm-hmm. and to leave my apartment. And now in 2016, I have mandatory exile Fridays. I have to leave my apartment. I have to go somewhere. Because if if I stay if I spend I I spend a lot of time in in my apartment editing and mm-hmm. running D and D and sleeping and et cetera et cetera mm-hmm. and uh, I forget that I can leave sometimes and that there is a whole giant world out there that I can experience without having to see it through the internet. So last Friday I went swing dancing in uh, Stratford and it was a great time. You're already off to a good start, then. Yes. Yes, I am. How about you? What are you embarrassed about from 2015? Uh, so, this is related to the podcast. Um, you will remember, back in November, we had a special guest on, and we made all sorts of promises and discussed all sorts of cool things about NaNoWriMo. Yes, and indeed. that we were going to attempt NaNoWriMo. I tried very hard. We tried very hard. 9,000 words. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't remember how many I got, but, um, so, I mean, like, there's a little bit about falling behind in NaNoWriMo, but for me, I just kind of stopped. Like, I, I fleshed out the start of the story. I had a general gist of where the story might go. I knew how it was going to end, but I couldn't make that tradition or transition from, like, the intro a little bit set up to the next bit. I just couldn't make that leap. And then it just got put on the back burner, and then it stayed on the back burner, then eventually all of the liquids kind of boiled away, and it kind of crusted over, and then it was really hard to scrape out of the pot, and then you just throw the pot away. Essentially what I'm saying is I quit. This is an elaborate analogy. I quit NaNoWriMo, and I feel really bad about it, Uh, not just because I made an internet promise. Um... (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, I, I felt really bad about it because it's also um, NaNoWriMo and quitting that is kind of a proxy for some of the other things like in the personal life of of quitting. So like uh, little projects that you start along the way or or like the the only thing that I really in 2015 that I managed to make stick was going to the gym consistently. Although uh, I started off going three days a week and eventually I transitioned down to two days a week because it was a little, little bit more manageable. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's. Obviously, recognizing when you need to scale back, but at least it wasn't a full quit. But there are other things that you know you start throughout the year with a good intention of finishing, and you just you just don't. So, like, I wanted to do a little bit more work with electronics in 2015. Yeah. Um, I didn't quit books because I almost wasn't reading any books, but I was really bad about like not following through on wanting to read more in 2015. Um, and then, yeah, so, like, NaNoWriMo is just the perfect example of one, especially you as an audience would know, of wanting to start something, and then you just, it just, we didn't even talk about, like, wanting to quit. It just, all of a sudden, we stopped, well, we ran out of videos for the month of November, but <laughs> but in December, we didn't really talk about it. Like, it was, we were both kind of like, yeah, we're just going to keep this quiet, and maybe nobody will notice. Um, but full disclosure, I quit fairly early on and the gym got a hell of a lot more progress out of it than I did but um, Desert Bus Desert Bus was what ruined me yeah so I I feel really embarrassed I can't, wa- I can't write and watch Desert Bus yeah yeah. so I'm, I'm embarrassed about uh, uh, the things that I quit in 2015 fair enough fair enough I forgive you there's always next November there is always next November or possibly September which is when I might try and do it <laughs> Because Desert Bus isn't moving, and I'm not abandoning Desert Bus for a week so that I can... Well, for its duration. Um, so, what did you learn in 2015? Uh, so, I mean, there was a fair amount of introspection and whatnot, but the thing that I value most of the things that I was learning how to do was... Honestly, just expanding my cooking skills. I mean, mm. if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know you'll know that when I'm not posting pictures of my dog, or click down below for a link to Ryan's Instagram. Yeah, or or um, 
passages out of books or you know the very various interesting things that I find. Um, so a non-zero percentage of your Instagram is like photos of lasagna. Yeah, or just things that I'm making. Um, and a lot of times I'll try things that I've perhaps not even eaten before. I just want to try it out as, mm-hmm. as a, a thing to cook. And sometimes I don't have the right ingredients. And so on the fly, I'll, I'll throw an audible or I'll call an audible and I'll just substitute stuff or I'll omit it completely. The, the one that I made just recently was um, I googled uh, beast. Uh, uh, beans and rice recipe. I almost combined beans and rice together to beasts. There's only like four or five thousand of those. Yeah, so I, that's I, actually probably a very conservative estimate. Yeah, so I, I googled bean bean and rice recipes because I'm like I I just bought like eight kilos of rice and <laughs> and I like beans and I'm not trying to be a vegetarian but I'm trying to cut down because meat is expensive. I'm trying to find ways of cooking interesting vegetarian dishes um, just to try it out. So I found a recipe. Um, the pr- the flavor profile is uh, ginger, spinach, coconut milk, and um, what was the other one? Or something else in there? Well, I guess the chickpeas. The chickpeas and the spinach don't really have a lot of flavor. They're the, more of the texture. But those are the the big ingredients. Um, and yeah, so you just you you make them make it in the pot, and then I just poured it over uh, rice, and it, it was really good. Um, and I hadn't tried a recipe quite like that. I don't. I've I've only had very limited experience with cooking with ginger, and it's largely in uh, like soups and whatnot to like make a. I think if you're making a, an, an Asian based soup, what you know, whatever an Asian based soup means, but usually in the recipe books, that's what it will be. Some sort of Asian based soup. Um, usually it involves um, fish oils, soy sauce, hoisin sauce, those kinds of flavors going in there, and ginger tends to be one of them. So I occasionally will buy ginger root. And just have it on hand in case I want to do something like that. For the, but this one was a different one. It wasn't a soup. It was a, it was a topping. Um, I feel like that's the mark of being an adult. Like, one of, one of the marks of being an adult. Like, when you were a child, the adults in your house chiefly prepare food for you. And mm-hmm. the things that you make are very are sort of very simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, I speak purely from my own experience. Because I, I'm an okay cook, but I'm just okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're sort of, like in your early 20s and you're like a teenager and a college student you sort of the 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 mark is that it's not so much that you can make any anything into food it's just that you'll eat anything mm. so whatever like what what do we have in the house that's what i'm eating yeah um as an adult you're like okay what do i have how do i make this into a dish yeah and then you make it into delicious food yeah and that is a, a, a very interesting skill to acquire. It took me a long time to sort of be able to dig through my cupboards with no plan and go, okay, this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. And dig out the flour and we'll make drop biscuits. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's another thing, too, is that transition, not just from what can I find in my cupboards... But also, what do I keep stocked? Yeah, what can I put in my cupboards yeah, uh, so that I can do this whenever I want? Yeah, to give yourself versatility beyond like salt and pepper. <laughs> so <laughs> and I so I made. I, if you look at the Instagram account, there's a fair number of things that I made. Um, the biggest one, I think I made pesto for the first time, mm, uh, yeah, and yeah. and I bought pesto from the market, and then eventually. I was able to get the so I, I stripped the plants of the leaves because uh, I got them as a, a bunch with roots intact. So I cut the roots off, and then I cut the leaves off. So I was left with the stalks, and I put the stalks in water, and they re-rooted themselves. The roots I tried putting in another container, and I think I think I drowned them out because the roots did not sprout, but the stalks developed roots, and eventually I transplanted that into a pot with with soil. And so now I have a full basil plant growing on my windowsill. And so I've developed a little bit of a, um, a garden. Yeah, it's pretty much Infinity that. basil now all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, it, it takes forever to, to get enough basil to, to make a new pesto. But, I mean, you can make a pesto out of anything. Basil's not the only ingredient, but... Uh, so but I, you'll find that basil is the B in up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, <laughs> B, A, start. <laughs> But yeah, so I made I made pesto, and then from the pesto, I made a really simple flatbread pizza. You know, just I made a pizza base like a, a dough, uh, 
spread the pesto on there. Got some bocconcini, uh, sautéed up some uh, some some um, spinach, and then just kind of layered it all on there with a drizzle of balsamic vinaigrette. And I threw it in the oven for a little bit, and boom, I had I, myself a pizza. I also had a pizza recently. It was frozen. I bought it. It was delicious. I bought it at the grocery store. Yeah. So that I'm not saying that I learned how to cook. But the various things that I cook that forced me to develop my skills, uh, I'm I'm very happy with with how 2015 went. And there are certainly more, much more things that I'm looking forward to doing, like not butchering my own chicken, but getting a whole chicken and carving out the parts to be able to like make soup stock and have this and have that, as opposed to just paying the expensive part for only the the sections that they've pre-cut. So, I'm looking for those kinds of skills. Hmm. Neat. As a, as, a, as a vegetarian, I, I don't really have to uh, think too hard about, mm. like, butchering celery. I just sort of cut it up. Yeah, but then you have to wonder whether you're going to chop it and quarter it, or if you're going to, like, finely cut it, or no, if you're going to no, julienne no. it. Or... No, 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 I have a very strict sort of celery cutting policy, because I'm aware of what celery texture I like. Yeah. So, tops, bottoms go off, cut all the stalks in half, dice it. Good to go. I don't think I cut them in half. I think I just, uh, usually quarters. It's got to be about an inch and a half long, but I think I leave them intact. I don't go in half. Yeah. Oh. I'm all about the stocks cut in half. Fair enough. Um, yeah, mine, my thing that I learned is uh, nobody cares. <laughs> Please elaborate. Yeah. That, that sounds weird. <laughs> the, the thing I learned about, about nobody cares about. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, have a no, nice no. day. Um, no, not that nobody, nobody cares about it. I mean, probably nobody cares about it, but... Uh, and it isn't sort of rooted in, in dark cynicism. Mm. Uh, no, one of the things I did this year was I learned to swing dance. We talked about it in the podcast with Ryan, where we had multiple Ryans, about productivity and things like that, and one of the, and, and busyness and the things you would like to get busy with. And one of the things was I said I want to learn to dance, and I did. In a sense, you wanted to get jiggy with it. Um, that's not what that means. That means Jing, be, that means dancing in the same way that Netflix and chill means wa- means watching movies. But Ryan. one is a precursor to the other. Chilling is a precursor to Netflix. No. <laughs> After this podcast, we'll, 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 we'll Google things with Ryan. Get you with it. I'm interrupting you. It's tell me how nobody. Na 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 na. Okay, fine. Tell me how nobody cares. No, I uh, I went to a, a social dance at this. Uh, we have a really cool swing club in cat in town. Uh, have cats, and my anxiety was just like through the roof because um, there's that. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of toxic masculinity stuff that comes with with dancing. There's a lot of uh, and and I have a I have a sort of high degree of anxiety in those settings in general, and from that and from from other occasions this year, I'm just I I I, I I'm consistently reminding myself that everyone is sufficiently wrapped up in whatever is going on in their head that they don't actually care that much. Um, you know, the things the things that you do around them are more or less irrelevant. And my anxiety is rooted in the notion, like the imagining that they care deeply about it. Um, because anxiety is narcissistic that way. Mm-hmm. But they don't. And they don't notice. Nobody really notices or cares. That was the, uh, I, I mentioned last Friday that I went dancing. And one of the really fun things about it was um, every once in a while, I, you know, I've, been, I've been swinging. I started in summer. So I've been doing it for about six months now. I'm still not great, but I'm passable. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we mess up or lose the beat or, or, you know, get caught halfway in a thing. And you just sort of figure it out. Mm-hmm. And nobody really minds. Um, people aren't really looking in, in that case when they're watching. They're not really watching your, your expertise so much as your energy. Mm-hmm. And... The notion that what matters is energy and not expertise is really interesting. It's, it isn't so much that you... It is sufficient to do something badly with enthusiasm sometimes. Mm-hmm. 
And that isn't something I'd, I'd really thought about very much. 2015 was a mental health year for me. It's kind of strange. I was thinking about something like that, but not in the context of me. Um, but there's a uh, there's bands that come and play at Chainsaw, and mm-hmm. a lot of times they are technically proficient. Not like I'm talking about like their technique and their ability to make notes and and melodies and whatnot are very proficient. But sometimes you'll be listening to a band, and it's just like it felt feels like there's no vitality behind it like they are making all the right sounds all the right notes in all the right orders and yet there's like a lifelessness to it whereas there are I've so- played those gigs yeah whereas <laughs> and I know some as a, a when you perform live some of that is contingent on the the crowd participation that it is much easier to feel alive when people are actively rooting for you as mm-hmm. opposed to just politely clapping between songs because they don't give a shit about what's going on uh, but yeah, th- and then there are some bands that come through the bar where I mean, like, yeah, they um, they could probably use a few more practice rounds before they start playing live. But they play like they're playing for a million people. But yeah, and they sell the hell out of it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was just thinking about that last night, and it's funny how you mentioned that. Like, it's mm-hmm. if if you're gonna fail, kind of deal, do it spectacularly with enthusiasm because people respect that more than you know, like you just don't make waves or anything. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Uh, and that is the thing that I learned, and I look forward to making more waves and doing things with more energy, which also, I guess, has to do with being a shut And oh my god, it all weaves together! It's amazing how, how like, we're not, we don't have distinct individual problems, but that a lot of times there's some sort of thread that connects Yeah, it's all almost like together. we're complex human beings with yeah. rich internal lives. And oh man, who would have thought that? And we just spend a bunch of our internal lives talking about it on the internet. I guess that means we should stop cutting people up and assuming they're, they're robots. Other than Descartes did that with, like, dogs but so i had this talk on the minecraft videos shit just got dark yo um i didn't realize i also had the had to have the don't boil people talk (laughs) in the podcast well (laughs) i'm gonna go get my woot suit dad pants and if you have a cool thing on 2015 from 2015 that you think we should see, uh, or if you want to brag about something or talk about something, uh, you can leave a comment, and we will read it. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe. It mm-hmm. Makes us very happy. Here gives us gives us the validation that we need. Yep. Uh, I believe the quote is "Smash that like button." <laughs> Uh, but I have to go and talk with Ryan about why you shouldn't cut people up on the assumption they're robots. So, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome in 2016. And so I said we should do a Lady in the Tramp thing. And he only had about this much of a Twizzler left. So he put it in his mouth, and I'm like... Fuck it, I'm doing it. <laughs> Time to commit. So I went in, and I was only able to like shave off just the tiniest little bit of the end. But I got a little bit of Twizzler, and I <laughs> felt his beard caress my beard. <laughs>